So far in class, we have looked at tank reactors, right? Batch and CSTRs. And at this point in the semester, we're gonna start moving to tubular type reactors. And that means plug flow reactors and packed bed reactors. And we're gonna spend a lot of time this semester trying to understand what happens inside of those two vessels. They both operate very similarly. So, you know, a tubular reactor has, um, you know, the geometry of basically just being a big cylinder. It's often just a pipe. And what you're doing is that, you know, you're feeding in uh, some mixture or occasionally just a pure reactant and then uh, out comes unreacted reactants as well as products and sometimes inerts and those types of things. Now, if we wanted to talk about an ideal tubular reactor, we would make a couple of different assumptions. The first one is that there is no density difference in the radial direction. Okay, and what that means is that if we take a cross section, right, that the composition is basically homogeneous everywhere in that cross section. Another assumption that we make is that there's no friction at the walls. And the nice thing about that assumption is it means that there's no boundary layer near the wall or there's no stagnant layer near the walls. So when you guys took fluids, you know, you were looking at flow through a pipe for a reason. It was this, it was that when we get here, we could talk about reactors. And there were two different things that you could assume. You know, one was that um, there was no slip at the walls, right? That's a very common assumption to make, right? No slip. And that means that the flow rate at the wall is basically zero, but then you have some maximum flow rate in the middle. And when that's the case, the flow profile looks like this, right? And flow is moving in that direction. In this case, we are not going to assume that an ideal reactor has those boundary layers on the outside of the wall or that there is slip at the walls. And what that would mean is that this should just move that way. And if that happened, then sometime in the future here, the plug or this cross section would move through the reactor as a function of time and it would move as a plug, hence the name plug flow reactor, where this slice moves independently through the reactor volume. And what's happening is that unlike a CSTR where you're exposed to all of the volume instantaneously, you move through the volume over time, okay? And we can let plug flow reactors operate for a very long time so they reach steady state. And we're gonna assume that that also happens in these reactors. And remember, what steady state means in our system isn't that the composition doesn't change with time or with distance through the reactor. What it means is if you took a snapshot now and a snapshot later, they would look the same. So yes, we know that the concentration will change from let's say this point in a reactor to here as it moves through it with some residence time. But if we looked there and there at you know time equal to, I'm gonna make up a hundred hours, right? And we also looked at it at you know a thousand hours, they would look the same. Right, the composition there wouldn't change. And that's really what steady state is. So you can definitely have flow. You can definitely have changes in concentration or even temperature and pressure and that sort of thing with, um, with residence time. But the actual time where you take snapshots, it all looks the same, okay? So that's really steady state. So let's try to apply these concepts to the mole balance um, equation that we have for a plug flow reactor. 
And of course we know that we're gonna start with in minus out plus generation minus consumption equals accumulation, or we've probably become much more comfortable at this point in the semester of writing that mole balance as the accumulation, right? Which is DNA DT equals in, right? The initial flow in minus out plus generation minus consumption, right? Where that's just one term. Now you'll notice I automatically did this for component A. So let's say that we're looking at some reaction in this PFR that A goes to B uh, in an elementary reaction with a rate constant that's equal to K1, okay? And if we do that, well, let's look at how this is going to, or how our principles for an ideal reactor is going to affect our mole balance. Well, obviously we're operating at steady state, so that goes to zero. And at this point in our derivation, this looks a whole lot like a CSTR, right? This is just FA zero minus FA plus RA times V. Now, if you remember though, in the CSTR, you put the, the inlet stream into the vessel, it becomes instantly homogeneously mixed. Well, that's certainly not the case here in this plug flow reactor. You, um, as you move along the reactor, the concentration will change and the volume that you have been exposed to up until that point has also changed. So it's not as easy as just putting the concentration in here because we don't know upfront what the effective volume in our calculation is because it's certainly not the entire volume of the reactor because you don't have access to it all at the beginning. So what we're gonna do instead is say that at each point in the reactor that we have access to some small fraction of that volume. And if that's the case, well, this really just becomes FA zero minus FA, or I apologize for that, FA minus FA zero equals RA times the some small amount of volume that we are occupying at this moment. Now, if we look at this, FA minus FA zero is just delta FA, right? And that equals RA times delta V. And now I'm gonna divide both sides by delta V. And we're gonna get that delta FA over delta V is equal to RA. And at this point, we can ask ourselves how small is this effective volume that the reaction is happening in at any given time. And if we allow that to be very small, then this becomes DFA DV is equal to RA. And that is the result of our mole balance for a plug flow reactor, okay? Now, because of how these operate, there are a couple of things to note here. One is that the volume is linked to length and it's also linked to time because there is some amount of time that it takes to move through this reactor. Now, if we don't like calling this time, I'm okay with that. It's gonna be residence time. And of course, that's also linked to the volumetric flow rate, which we'll get to. Of course, we also know that the flow rate and the concentration are gonna be linked by the volumetric flow rate as well. So this result for the mole balance is re relatively straightforward looking, and we can manipulate it in a number of ways based on the problem statement that we are that we are given, okay? So from here, what I would like for us to do is to look at this reaction A goes to B and now just derive for this simple reaction expressions for the concentration as a function of the residence time. And this is gonna look and feel very familiar to you guys. Now, 
if we want to directly link the concentration, we want to get concentration here and we want to get the concentration there. Well, remember the first thing that we've done when we've solved all the problems that we've done so far this semester is find the rate law. So we know that RA is just equal to minus K1 times CA. And that holds everywhere inside of the plug flow reactor. And then we've applied this to our mole balance. So this is DFA dv is equal to minus k1 times ca and in our previous lecture on flow in cstrs you'll remember that the flow rate of a is just equal to the concentration of a times the volumetric flow rate so this becomes dca v dv is equal to minus k1 times ca and let's say that um the volumetric flow rate is equal to a constant. And we should expect that to be the case. Uh, even if this were a gas phase reaction, remember that A goes to B. So the number of moles doesn't change. So the volumetric flow rate should stay the same or more or less the same. So this expression becomes the volumetric flow rate times DCA DV equals minus K1 times CA. And The next thing that we can do is use our definition that the residence time equals the volume divided by the volumetric flow rate. If the volumetric flow rate changes, the definition is actually over V0. But in this case, the volumetric flow rate is the same. So we can just use the symbol for the volumetric flow rate. And that means that this expression becomes DCA divided by D, sorry guys, D. V over the volumetric flow rate equals minus K1 times CA, or that DCA D tau equals minus K1 times CA. And hopefully this expression looks extremely familiar to you guys because the result for a constant volume batch reactor was DCA DT equals minus K1 times CA, right? And so the only difference from a mathematical perspective is that a plug flow reactor here has tau instead of time. And it's easy for us to solve this. So I won't waste our time by going through the whole derivation again, because we've done it a couple of times. And that means that CA is just equal to CA zero times the exponent of minus K one times tau. And there's the concentration of A through our reactor as a function of the residence time. And the residence time really is a measure of how far we've come across um, our length because right here, the volume, we could do a number of things with the volume, right? So volume could, um, you know, we could think of this as just being equal to um, the volumetric flow rate times tau. We also could think of the volume as the cross-sectional area times the length of the reactor. So we also, if we wanted to, could get expressions like DCA DL, right? And look at how the concentration changes over length. And we'll do problems that are like that this semester where we're asked you know, to calculate how the concentration changes over the length. But you can very easily switch between tau and length um, without any problems. So, we can do the same thing for B, right? And here's where maybe having not derived a, a general form at the beginning uh, makes us spend another minute or so here. But if we did the same thing for B, the mole balance would be DNB DT equals FB zero minus FB plus RBV. And again, we're still operating at steady state. And so this would just become, you know, delta FB over delta V equals RB with the same steps we did before, or DFB DV is equal to RB. And um, we could make the exact same substitutions we made a minute ago. And we know that RB is equal to minus RA. So it's just K1 times CA based on the stoichiometry. And we would get back to this point where um, that looks very familiar, that DCB D tau equals K1 times CA 
right? Or DB, oops, sorry guys, DCB, D tau equals K1 times our expression for CA, which was CA zero times the exponent of minus K1 times tau. And again, this is the exact same differential equation that we solved for a batch reactor, except now we have tau, not time. And so if we solve for the concentration of B, then this is just equal to CA zero times one minus the exponent of minus K1 tau, right? Exact same math that we did for a batch reactor. In addition to this, we also can look at the conversion. And we found in some of our previous examples that you know, finding solutions as a function of conversion is, is very helpful, especially uh, when you have gas-based reactions. We have equations already that link the concentrations to uh, the volumetric flow rate, to epsilon, to conversion. It'd be really nice to be able to use those. So if we, if we wanted to solve this same problem, A goes to B in terms of conversion, well, we could start with DFA DV, right, is equal to RA. And if you remember, you know, the flow of A is just FA zero times one minus the conversion. So DFA just equals minus FA zero times dx. And we can make that substitution here, that minus fa0 times dx dv is equal to ra. We also can get things in terms of the concentration, where remember fa0 is just ca0 times our initial volumetric flow rate. And if we assume that it's constant, as we did a minute ago, um, then that's just CA0 times V. And from here, we can make that substitution here on the left-hand side. This can just become minus CA0 times the volumetric flow rate times DX DV equals RA. And of course, RA is equal to our rate law, which is minus K1 times CA. And if we remember our last lecture, it's very relatively straightforward to link CA to, um, to the conversion as well. And we end up with an expression that CA times V, right, equals CA zero times V zero times one minus X. And you know there were no change of moles here. There's no change in temperature or it could just be a liquid phase reaction. And we already said that the two volumetric flow rates were equal to each other. And so they are going to cancel, right? So those are gonna go away. And we're gonna end up with CA in this problem at least equals CA zero times one minus X. And now we can, um, we can look at this problem, right? So this equals minus K1 times CA zero times one minus X. And we can do the exact same thing that we did a minute ago and change this to minus CA zero times DX over DV over the volumetric flow rate equals minus K1 CA zero times one minus X. And when we do this, of course, the denominator of this differential is gonna become equal to the residence time. The negatives are gonna cancel and CA zero is gonna cancel. And so we're left with DX D tau is equal to K1 times one minus X and we know then that dx over one minus x equals k1 d tau. And we can integrate this from zero to the residence time. And this from assuming that this is the beginning of the reactor from zero to x. And when we do that, we can solve, uh, we can solve the equation. So this just becomes the natural log of one minus x evaluated from zero to x equals k1 times tau. 
And then this, because the natural log of one is equal to zero, uh, becomes just minus the natural log of one minus x equals k1 times tau. And so we end up with, um, if we take the exponent, that one minus x equals the exponent of minus k1 tau, and then the conversion equals one minus the exponent of minus k1 times tau, right? And this also should look very familiar. It's the same expression that we ended up with um, for a batch reactor, except it was with respect to time, not tau. And actually, I forgot a negative here. Sorry, guys. Okay. And so these are a couple of simple applications of concepts that we've gone over in class previously this semester, but now to plug flow reactors instead of CSTRs or batch reactors. And what we can do now maybe is look at the difference in how a CSTR, which we talked about for a couple lectures and a PFR utilize their volume. And it's interesting to do this because the CSTR is naturally diluting. We've said that before, where you put the reactant in the, con in the vessel and you're operating at the lowest concentration the entire time. Whereas a plug flow reactor, as you utilize the volume, you're moving along the reactor itself. And so you've gone through a larger portion of the volume, but you can think of the reactor size as being sort of uh, a small differential volume. And it's just moving through as a plug through the reactor. So what does that mean about how they might utilize volume? Or if you had, um, if you had a reactor that was operating at the same volumetric flow rate, what would the conversion be for a CSTR versus a PFR as a function of the residence time or as you move through that reactor or the, as a function of the total reactor volume, all right? And to look at that, I think we can start with the expression that we derived just a second ago where the conversion in our PFR for our very simple reaction, you know, where A just goes to B and it's elementary was equal to one minus the exponent of minus K1 tau. And the exact same expression for a CSTR we derived a couple of lectures ago. Again, when just A goes to B in this irreversible elementary reaction, that this was equal to K1 tau over one plus K1 tau. And when I think about this and I want to compare the conversion versus the volume or versus the residence time in a CSTR or PFR, let's just plot this and have a look at it, okay? And plots are gonna become helpful to us in just a minute. All right, so let's do that. So there's the plot of the conversion in a PFR versus a CSTR versus residence time. And remember, since they're operating at the same volumetric flow rate, this also is volume. So what this means when you look at this is that as, it, or if you're looking for a specific conversion, a PFR will always require a lower volume than a CSTR. And you can see that here, let's say that we were going for a conversion of 0 0.5. Well, if you look at that here, right here, 0 0.5, and there would be the residence time of our PFR, and here would be the residence time of our CSTR, right? And higher residence time means larger volume. There's also a more visual way to think about this. And there's also a way to maybe estimate some of this using, using data without having to plot this whole thing. 
And it's buried in their mole balances. So we just derived an expression for a PFR a second ago where minus FA0 times dx dv equals the rate of reaction. And let's not forget that. This is the rate of reaction. And when we've looked at data before, that's what we measure with time. I mean, you might measure concentration, um, but you're, you can link that back to, um, to rate data. And I can just reorganize this and say that dV is equal to FA0 dx over minus RA. And you might not think that this is particularly interesting, but let's say that I were to plot something like minus one over the rate versus FA0 times um, dx, right? Or actually not versus dx, versus x. Or you could also plot minus FA0 over RA versus x. Well, if you look at this, if we had the integral of this plot, right, of this function, that would just give us the reactor volume. And let's look at that. So if you were to plot FA0 over minus RA versus the conversion, right, and these are things that you could measure, the area under that curve would give you the volume of the PFR that you need. And this is called a Levenspiel plot. We didn't talk about this for CSTRs, but we could do the exact same thing. And remember for a CSTR, we got to an expression that FA zero times X was equal to RA times V. And I could just solve for volume and that would be equal to FA zero over RA times X. Well, this is the area under a curve, right? Right, this is not, there's no differential here. This is a box on a plot. And so if we look at a Levenspiel plot for the same process for a CSTR and a PFR, the PFR is on the left, the CSTR is on the right, and they're trying to achieve a conversion equal to 0 0.8. And doing so obviously here requires a much larger area than uh, for a CSTR than it does for a PFR. And we talked a couple of lectures ago about a series of CSTRs. And we did an example problem where the conversion that you could achieve from a single large CSTR was lower than the conversion that you could achieve from a series of smaller CSTRs. And that's actually shown pretty well in this plot here, where um, as you decrease the volume of a CSTR, and here each of the gray boxes has the same volume, you get closer and closer and closer to this line and the total volume is less. Because remember, if we had one reactor, this would be the volume of a single reactor to achieve the same conversion. And you can actually get to an, a PFR-like expression if you think of it as an infinite series of CSTRs, even though they follow slightly different rules. Now this bodes an interesting question. Should you always use a CSTR and not a PFR? And the answer is no. And there are a few uh, explanations for this. So first of all, your rate of reaction might not follow that same pattern where it always increases or FA0 over minus RA might not always increase, right? The rate might not always go down. One of the things that could happen is let's say that you're measuring what's happening in a reactor and the temperature is changing 
Or what if you have a really complex reaction network? It doesn't just have A goes to B. You have some intermediate that you're interested in, right? Or A goes to B to C. Or A goes to B, which goes to C and D, then D goes to E, et cetera. And we've solved some problems like that this semester. So complex reaction networks and changes in the um, operating parameters like temperature and pressure can lend themselves to more complex reaction networks. So, you know, maybe as an example using this plot, if we were to say, let's use a PFR to do this in, in just this example where one over R is very complicated. Well, if you were to use a PFR, this is the area that we're interested in, right? If we did the same thing with a CSTR, this would be the area, would be that box. And so here's a case where you don't simply have the reaction rate always decreasing over the length of a reactor, where um, going to a, a, a CSTR might be, uh, might be a better option. The other thing that you could do is that if you still looked at this and said, well, I want to go to a higher conversion, right? You could get all the way to here or what you could do with a complex reaction network is that let's say you went to some conversion here, then once you get to here, this minimum, you could use a PFR to get you the rest of the way. And this to get to that specific conversion would be the lowest volume to get there. And we'll solve some example problems this semester where, where you're going to do this. Um, you're gonna look at combinations of CSTRs and PFRs. We'll do a little bit of that in the next lecture. And then, like I said, you'll get to practice that more in homework. The last thing that we're gonna do today is to find an expression for the conversion as a function of residence time for a PFR where a gas phase reaction is occurring isothermally and isobarically. And I wanted to do this because it implements some of the things we did in the last lecture, where we know that for a gas phase reaction where the number of moles change, we have to take that into consideration when we're looking at things like the concentration, conversion, et cetera. Now, our rate law in this case, where A goes to 2B irreversibly, is not different than it was in the previous example, right? So the rate law for A is equal to minus K1 times CA. And if we were to need the rate law for B, we won't in this particular example, but if we were to do this, it would just be minus two times RA because RA over its stoichiometric coefficient is equal to RB over its stoichiometric coefficient. So this becomes RA over minus one equals RB over two, right? So RB is just minus two times RA. And that gets us to two times K1 times CA. And now we're gonna implement this in our mole balance. And for a plug flow reactor, our mole balance or the result of our mole balance was DFA DV is equal to RA. And so that means DFA DV equals minus K1 times CA. And let's get this in terms of conversion. Well, that's gonna require two substitutions. One is here, and it's one that we already did earlier. And then the other one is going to be here for the concentration of A. So remember that FA was equal to FA zero times one minus X. So DFA just equals minus FA zero times X. And that's gonna make the left side of this equation just minus FA zero times DX DV. And that's equal to K1 times CA. And now we're gonna bring the volumetric flow rate into this because we know that's where we want to go at the end. The whole purpose of taking the changing number of moles into consideration is 
so we can correct for this difference in the volumetric flow rate. So FA0 we know is equal to CA0 times the initial volumetric flow rate. And we know from our derivations in our previous lectures that the concentration of any species J is equal to CA0 times capital theta J plus the relative stoichiometry relative to A times the conversion divided by one plus epsilon X times P over P zero times T zero over T. And we're gonna implement that in this, or those two changes here. So this becomes minus CA zero times the volumetric flow rate times DX DV equals minus K1 times CA zero and this is time. So for, for A, this is equal to one, right? And obviously that's minus one. So that just becomes times one minus X over one plus epsilon X. And if you remember our definition for epsilon was that it was equal to the initial mole fraction of A times the change in the number of moles divided by the stoichiometry for A. And so let's say that that's equal to one, right? That we have a mole fraction of one at the beginning times the change in the number of moles, right? So that's one. And then the stoichiometry for A is also one. So that means epsilon in our example here is just equal to one. So we're gonna gain um, moles. And so the volume, the, uh, the volumetric flow rate is gonna to have to adjust accordingly. So then this just becomes one plus X. Right? So one minus X over one plus X. So the negative signs will cancel. CA zero is going to cancel. And remember that the um, volume over the volumetric flow rate is just tau. Right, the initial volumetric flow rate is tau. So our equation then just becomes dx d tau is equal to k1 times one minus x over one plus x, okay? So there's our, our differential. Now there are a number of ways that we could do this or solve this, right? We could do, um, we could do Euler's method. Um, you also can solve this analytically and it's not, it's not bad. I don't want to spend any of our last few minutes in class, you know, doing the full derivation for this because um, this integral is, is in integral table, so it should be okay. But what I wanted to do was then talk about the fact that we don't have to bring X into the equation. We don't have to. We also could solve this in terms of flow rates. So if we start at the same place we were a minute ago, right? Minus K1 times CA. Well, here, right? FA is just equal to CA times the volumetric flow rate. So we could make a different substitution, right? DFA DV is just equal to minus K1 times FA divided by the volumetric flow rate. And this might look a little bit weird because we haven't, um, we haven't solved you know, problems with respect to FA. We usually try to do this in terms of concentration, but you don't necessarily have to do this. And then, you know, DFA DV, right? That's just equal to minus K1 times FA divided by, now we don't necessarily know the volumetric flow rate uh, directly, but we know the initial volumetric flow rate. And so remember in our class last time that you know, PV is equal to FRT. And if we look at this from um, as a ratio between the initial and the final conditions, right? That just becomes P zero, V zero is F zero times R times T zero. So in our problem, we said it was gonna be isobaric and isothermal. 
So those go away. And of course the R's are gonna cancel. And we could always then just say that V is V zero times F. And that's the total divided by the initial number of moles. Well, if that's the case, then that just becomes divided by V zero times F over the initial number of moles. And that's just equal to minus K one times FA zero over V zero times FA over FT. And that substitution comes because if it's A at the beginning, that's just equal to FA zero. So that also comes above, right? So that term is actually that term, just to make it clear. And so now we have an expression for the change in the flow rate of A as a function of the volume, right? It's just minus um, K1 FA0 over V0 times FA over FT. And I'll do two quick other substitutions, right? I can move this back to here and make that tau and get DFA D tau equals minus K1 times FA0 times FA over FA plus FB, right? So that would be one equation that we could solve. And then we could do the same thing for, for B, right? It would be the exact same mole balance, the same substitutions. And then we'd have a system of equations that we would just put in Euler's method. Our instinct though has always been concentration. And to get things in terms of concentration, here, I'll leave this in case people haven't finished writing yet. And that means that when we have an expression like DFA DV equals minus K1 times CA, it feels more natural to just say FA is equal to CA times V. And this becomes DCA V DV equals minus K1 times CA. And we could do um, the chain rule and this becomes CA times DV DV plus V times DCA DV is equal to minus K1 times CA. And then we can get to CA is, um, or DCA DV is equal to minus K1 over V times CA minus CA over V times DV DV. And that's okay, you can solve this, but all of our expressions for V either, um, or this V and how it changes is either a function of the conversion or the flow rates. And my preference is to not do this, to get things in terms of concentration this way. My preference is to either solve for the conversion using Euler's method or a software package or analytically, and then calculate the concentrations using that equation, right? Just use it as an algebraic expression. Or to do this as a function of flow rates and also implement that equation to get us the volumetric flow rates um, or, and, and from there, right, you can get the concentration because you know that the concentration of A leaving is just, um, is the flow rate of A divided by the volumetric flow rate, right? And so if you solve for the molar flow rates, then you can easily implement that equation and then get CA. So that's my preference with a plug flow reactor is to solve things uh, when it's slightly more complicated in terms of flow or conversion. And then if you actually need the absolute concentration to use one of those two expressions that we had to algebraically calculate concentration.